Hey guys, Pastor Ben here with another review and reflection. Today I'm going to talk about a book I just finished called The Commonatory by St. Vincent of Lorenz. Um, this is a book that may seem a little obscure, but you might be more familiar with it than you think. Um, this is a, a, a work written by the church father, Vincent of Lorraine, uh, or Vincentinius, as he's sometimes called, if you want to use the Latin name, um, who was writing in, uh, he actually wrote this book in 434, just a couple of years after the Council of Ephesus. So just to kind of locate you, he would be a contemporary with someone like Augustine, for example. Um, and Vincent is writing kind of as the, the period of the early church is kind of beginning to come to a close. You know, we like to use terms like the early church, the medieval church, the modern church, whatever. Of course, no one at that point is thinking of themselves as being in one period or another. So those are kind of artificial categories we push back. But as we think about how we generally track things, the first 500 years are often viewed as being part of the early church. And then after that, you're beginning to shift into, in the West at least, something that we would call the medieval church. So Vincent is writing kind of towards the end of one period or the beginning of another. And um, not only because of when he's writing, but the subjects that he's writing about uh, have made this little book very important and very interesting for later Christians to read and learn from. So what is it that Vincentinius is actually getting at or Vincent is getting at in this book? Well, uh, the, the title, A Commonatory, uh, means a remembrance. And he talks in the beginning of this little book about how he's writing down these things because he wants to remember and meditate on and learn uh, the kind of core important things. So what is it that he's reminding himself of and re reminding us of? Well, he, he fleshes out um, in the uh, second chapter of the book. If you've read from the Church Fathers, you'll know that um, they often break up their books into you know, fairly short, you know, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. So you think of it almost more like a section or a heading. So under the second heading, he talks about how he wants to articulate a, a general rule for distinguishing the truth of the Catholic faith from the falsehood of heretical pravity. That's the, the heading that we have here. In other words, what Vincent is trying to do is to think through how do you know if a teaching that you're hearing is something that you should accept or something you re should reject? Is it something that is orthodox and Catholic? And I'll talk about those terms in a moment. Or is it something that is heretical? So it's a question that anyone who has been a Christian or even anyone who's just thinking about Christianity has to grapple with because there are all sorts of different organizations today, even different religions today that would all say, oh, we're teaching what God wants us to, to believe, or we're teaching what the Bible teaches, or we're teaching what the church teaches, um, but they're not all teaching the same thing. So how do you decide, how do you discern between truth and falsehood? And that's the question, that's the challenge that Vincent was facing in his day as well, and that he wants to help us think through as Christians. So first off, let me just define a couple of terms, and I think this is really important when we come to a work like the Commonatory, because Vincent is using language that we will use today. He'll use words like Catholic. He'll use words like Orthodox. And it can be easy for us to assume that the way that we might sometimes use those words is the same way that he's using those words. Now, of course, when we use the term Catholic or we talk about the Catholic Church, most people think about the Roman Catholic Church, the organizational branch of the Western Church that centers on um, the, 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 the rule of the Bishop of Rome, or, or is under the rule of the Bishop of Rome. Maybe it's a better way of putting it. In other words, Roman Catholic is in opposition to the Eastern Orthodox churches, and the Protestant churches, so on and so forth. Of course, that is not what Vincent has in mind, because in his day, there are no Protestant churches. There are no Eastern Orthodox churches. All of those churches have their roots in the time that he's talking about. So we want to be careful as we read Vincent to not see him as being a representative of just one branch of the church. This is really important. As I was kind of looking at reviews that people wrote on Amazon or whatever about this book, it was amazing how many people would go back and say, oh yeah, Vincent is arguing for the Roman Catholic Church. 
Or sometimes people would say, oh no, he's really arguing, arguing against the Roman Catholic Church for the Eastern Orthodox Church or, or whatever. Um, there's definitely a lot of um, relevant questions and discussions that Vincent raises in this book that Protestants, Roman Catholics, and Eastern Orthodox can all interact with to great profit. But it would be a, a, a mistaken project to try and go back and say, is he in my group or in your group or in your group or whatever? That's not really how Vincent is thinking, and we're not going to understand him if that's the main question that we're asking. So I may share some thoughts here as a Protestant Reformed pastor about my take on Vincent of Lorenz, uh, Comanatory, some of the suggestions that he gives. I think I, I find a lot that I'm drawn to in, in what he argues here, and it is relevant, I think, to some of the, the things that separate Roman Catholics from Protestants, from Eastern Orthodox. Um, but even saying that, I'm not trying to retroactively go back and say, you know, Vincent is the exact same kind of Protestant Reformed, you know, person that I am. That would be an anachronistic project. So I'm not, not even going to go there. So what is it that Vincent argues? Well, a lot of people are familiar with part of what Vincent says, because he talks about how, you know, he, he, he wants to know um, if there's a rule that he can use to distinguish between the truth of the Catholic faith and the falsehood of heretical pravity. And he says, as I have asked my teachers about this, as I have gone and asked other um, godly men, you know, mature teachers, he says, I have always, and in almost every instance, this is chapter 2, received an answer to this effect, that whatever I or anyone else should wish to detect, that, that whether I or anyone else should wish to detect the frauds and avoid the snares of heretics as they rise, and to continue sound and complete in the Catholic faith, again, not Roman Catholic, universal Catholic, that's what he means, we must, the Lord helping, fortify our own belief in two ways, first by the authority of divine law, and then by the tradition of the Catholic Church. He's going to restate this too at the end of the book as well. He says, first, you go to the scriptures to know what they mean, and if there's dispute about the scriptures, you can look at how the church has interpreted the scriptures. That's his kind of key idea. And he puts some more specific in, um, guidance for us here when he talks about what does he mean by the tradition of the Catholic Church. Again, people can read that term tradition, think about how it's used today, especially after something like the Council of Trent, and assume that's what Vincent means. Council of Trent has not happened. He's 1,100 years before the Council of Trent. He's 15, 1,600 years before the discussions that we're having today. So let's understand Vincent on his own terms, because most of what he's talking about in this book is what is tradition and how can it guide us, okay? So here's how he kind of gives us some guidance in terms of what tradition is. He says um, that, um, let's see here, towards the end of, of, of chapter two, he says, um, in the Catholic Church itself, all possible care must be taken that we hold that faith which has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. That's a phrase that's sometimes summarized as the Vincentinian canon, or the, the rule of Vincent. Basically, Vincent's rule for sorting out different competing theologies is this. He says, okay, if I'm faced with a new teaching, I want to ask myself, is this something that has been believed everywhere, always, and by all? And he kind of gives three words we can work with there. He says what you're looking for, basically, is universality, antiquity, and consent. So if you want to know if something has been taught um, everywhere, always, and by all, you ask yourself, first off, the question of, you kind of take the test of universality. Is this a doctrine that is only known in one little part of the church, right? So, so if, if only the church is in North Africa, hold to this, and no one else in the rest of the world holds to this, that should be a red flag in your mind. What you're looking for is something that not just one part of the church or one faction of the church holds to, but something that has been held broadly by more than just one part of the church. So you're kind of looking around you and seeing, has this gained traction, broadly speaking? The second thing that he points us to is antiquity. So you're not just looking around you, you're looking not just for breadth, but for depth. Is this a doctrine that has roots going back to earlier centuries, and especially to the earliest centuries. You want to go back to the church fathers, um, and you want to go back to um, those who are recognized authorities in the church and say, is this something that I can find in some form, and he'll talk about 
development and what's legitimate and not legitimate doctrinal development later in the book. But he says you want to go back and be able to see it earlier on, right? And then you're also looking for consent. What he's talking about there really is has the church not just not, not just can you find individuals who have talked about this, but have have there been either prominent teachers in the church who have explicitly taught this, or have there been especially councils or creeds that have stated this, where churches have adopted this as something that they say, yes, credo, you know, this I believe, this I confess. And Vincent says that is a rule, that's a test that you can apply to different doctrines to help you figure out what is Catholic in the sense of being universal, accepted, and right versus what is heretical. Now, what he does in the rest of the book is to unpack what those categories look like, to talk about some of the heresies that have sprung up in the church, and he goes through a number of different heresies that have sprung up, Apollinarius and Photinius and um, uh, Nestorius and others as well, and also talks about the, 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 the Catholic faith that we should hold to. So there's a lot of, of, of ground that he covers. Um, one thing I should say, I should, should have said this at the beginning, this is a, um, a book that's well worth your time, partially because it won't take a whole lot of time. Um, what I have here is the 11th volume in the Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers series. Um, Vincent's Commonatory is only about 40 pages of this book, so um, don't be scared by the size of it. It's contained in this book. Um, now, if you're familiar with this series, the Schaff series, Church History, um, you'll know that the way that they lay things out, you've got these nice small print and double columns. So you can take whatever the length is in here and multiply it by about two or three times to get the actual like print size of the book. But still, you're looking at a book that's probably 100 to 120 pages. And sometimes the fathers can be quite dense and difficult to read. Uh, I was surprised. I'd never read Vincent before. Vincent is very easy to read. He does a really good job of, at the beginning of the book, he says, here's my argument, and then he makes his argument, and then at the end of the book, he says, all right, let me recap. Here's what I was arguing for. Here's what I was saying. So there's a very clear kind of structure. He, he has short little chapters, again, kind of headings that kind of walk you through, and he's also just a good writer. I mean, he has a great turn of phrase throughout. So um, again, I'm always, I'm always amazed when you go back and read the primary sources. Um, as C.S. Lewis talks about, you know, we can kind of be intimidated, and we think, I can't read you know, the Church Fathers. Uh, I can't read Calvin. I can't read, you know, Bunyan or something. But when you go back, you find, oh, no, they are understandable. And as Lewis says, their very greatness is what makes them approachable. Um, that's not true in every instance, but it is true in this instance. And so I would definitely encourage you pick up a copy of the book if you're interested in these kinds of things. Okay. Now, I should have said it at the beginning, so let me jump back into Vincent's argument. Um, as he walks through this, He's, he's, he's applying his rule to different heresies that have popped up. He's helping to explain what the rule helps us to hold on to, what it does show. And he also addresses questions that people have along the way. He does a really good job of saying, you know, but someone will say, you know, if, if, um, you know, if God is in control, then why would he allow, right, false teachers to pop up? And Vincent says, let's talk about that. And uh, he gives, he gives uh, a good answer to that, I think. He points us back to Deuteronomy and how even in the Old Testament, when God was um, giving prophets to Israel, he told them, you will have prophets who seem to be from me, but they're going to stand up and they're going to say something that's contrary to my word. They're going to try to turn you away from my word and turn you away from my worship to turn you to other idols. And when you know that, they're being sent to test you. And Vincent takes that as God's answer for why he allows false teachers to come into the church sometimes. He says, first off, Satan's trying to do that, right? But why would God permit it? Well, because it's a testing for the church. And um, Vincent goes through different um, figures from the early church. He talks a lot about Origen, who he says, you know, brilliant guy, has all these marks of piety. You know, there's all these reasons why you'd want to believe what he says. But when you look at what he says, it's turning you away from God's word. It's turning you away from the pure worship of God um, and is, is a test to the church, right? So he does a good job of kind of answering some of those questions, thinking through some of those issues. Now, let me just try to draw this to a close because I realize this video has already gone on longer than I 
wanted to to just talk a little bit about um, how this work maps onto some of the discussions that take place between Roman Catholics, Protestants, and Eastern Orthodox, and um, and maybe some some things for us to be aware of and avoid, so that again we don't mangle Vincent and try to turn him into a weapon in our war, uh, but at the same time really learn from what he says because one of the things you find is you know at the time of the Reformation and in a, in, in a lot of apologetic discussions today between these different groups, the question of what's the relationship of the Bible to the church and tradition like that that's front and center. What you find in the early church is that there is data on those questions, but the church is not directly grappling with those questions by and large. Generally speaking, the information that we have about how the fathers think about tradition or the scriptures and you know so forth is something that we kind of have to derive by good and necessary consequence. Often they're talking about you know some issue over here, and we have to pull out a phrase and say, okay, you know I think this maps onto our discussion over here in this way. And that's obviously difficult to do. Well, Vincent's book is kind of, it's the closest thing I'm aware of, I'll put it that way, to a church father that's kind of self-consciously trying to think about what's the role of tradition? How can it be helpful for us? And so um, I, I actually find, as a Protestant, as a Reformed pastor, his answer to be very helpful, um, which might be surprising, because a lot of people who read Vincent, and you know, you go look at the reviews on Amazon, you'll see people saying, oh, he talks about... The Catholic faith, he talks about tradition, he talks about how, you know, people disagree over scripture, so you need to look back at what the fathers have said, and, you know, that all sounds Roman Catholic to people. Um, first off, you can go look at my review on Keith Matheson's book, The Shape of Sola Scriptura, and what you'll find as you read that book is that the views of the Protestant reformers are actually much more in line with what Vincent is arguing for, and they would have, I think, very few quibbles with the way that he frames things. Um, because uh, for, for a couple of reasons. So first off, what Vincent points to when he says, how do you know where the Catholic Church is, the universal church is? What he points to is not institutional unity. What he points to is not this kind of infallible teaching office in the church. What he points us to basically is, first off, doctrinal unity. And he says the way that you dis that can discern that doctrinal unity, he doesn't say, go to the Bishop of Rome, or go to, you know, this, that, or the other uh, authority. He says, no, go back, look at the fathers, look at what they have written, look at what they have said, weight everything accordingly, and that will help you to see what the church has clearly and universally held to. So when he's actually answering the question, what he's basically doing is he's giving an argument for, for historical theology. He's giving an argument for reading uh, the Bible and doing theology in conversation with the church. It's not something to shortchange that conversation and say just go to these external authority and let them tell you what it should be. He's actually pushing you to engage with the fathers and with the scriptures directly. So I think there's something there that we can all appreciate and learn from whether you're Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, or Protestant. He's not arguing just for one strand of that, if I could put it that way. A second thing, um, I found this very interesting. Um, he gives a couple of clarifiers towards the end of the book of, of, of exactly where his rule does and doesn't apply. So if you're looking at this, it would be chapter 28. I think this is a very important chapter. And he basically gives two kind of um, nuances or qualifiers to his rule. So he says at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book, you know, if you want to know truth from error, here's what you do. You look for what has been taught always by all people at all times. So you're looking at universality, you're looking at antiquity, you're looking at consent, right? Well, some people will pull that phrase out and say, that's the answer. If you have any question about doctrine, any question about how to interpret part of the Bible, you know, that's what you do. Vincent actually says that doesn't apply in every case. In chapter 28, what he says is there's two Two things to keep in mind. First off, he said, this will not resolve every question. It won't answer every minor question about every doctrine, every scripture, everything that we might have questions about. He says, really, all this is going to get you, this is very important, right? But what this will get you is what he calls the rule of faith. And that's a, a phrase, the regula fide, that has roots back into the earlier centuries of the church. It pops up first in Irenaeus of Lyon. In the second century, it's used by different fathers throughout. But when the, when the um, church fathers talk about the rule of faith, what they're meaning is 
the summary of the essentials of what you have to believe to be a Christian. So if you want an example of that, the example that comes out is something like the Apostles' Creed right? You believe in the triune God, you believe in God as creator, you believe in God as redeemer, you believe uh, in Christ uh, incarnation. Those are the doctrines that Vincent has in view. He's not talking about every other debate and doctrine that different denominations have. He's not talking about all the things that Roman Catholics and Protestants might agree or disagree on. He has in view something more basic and more foundational, which is that kind of core key summary of the faith. And he says, if you want to know what that is, you can apply this rule and it will help you to discern it. So that's the first thing, is it doesn't apply to every question. It really applies to those kind of core essential questions of what do you need to believe to be orthodox, lowercase o, orthodox, or Catholic, lowercase c. Um, that's what he's getting at. The second caveat is, he says, this won't necessarily help you when you're trying to resolve debated questions that have a long history. In other words, what he's saying is, this is really a rule that you can use to apply to new doctrines, right? That was what was going on in his day. You had someone like Nestorius coming up, teaching something new about Christ. How do you know if that is true or heresy? Well, Vincent says, you go back. You look for you know, universality, antiquity, consent. Does it fit those things? If it does, you accept it. If it doesn't, you reject it, right? It's useful in that way. I think in our day, we could look at something like Mormonism. Jehovah's Witnesses, Unitarians, um, open theism. These are all different ways, you know, liberalism, uh, liberal Christianity. These are all saying things about Christ, about the Trinity, uh, about salvation that are novel and new. How do we know if we should accept them or not? Well, we can apply the Vincentinian canon. We can apply this rule and be able to say right out of the gate, this is not what the church has taught and therefore it should be rejected. It's not what the scriptures teach, and therefore should be rejected. Um, so he says when you're dealing with new questions, this can help you to, 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 to avoid falling into error, because this is one of the kind of conceptual things that Vincent has, and I think the fathers have, that we as modern people really need to learn from. And that is that they understand that what it means to be a Christian um, is to maintain, to preserve, and to hold on to what you have received. So the Christian is not an author or an innovator. Our job is not to topple old orthodoxies and usher in new ways of thinking. Christianity is not revolutionary in its orientation. It is conservative, not in the sense of you know how we might use that politically necessarily, but conservative in the sense that it's looking to preserve and pass on something that has been handed down to us in the scriptures and in the history of the church's interpretation of scripture. That's a Christian orientation. That's a Christian attitude. And so Vincent is a really good kind of pushback to our modern age, which is always looking for something new and something novel. And he's saying, no, that's not, that's not the pattern uh, of, of the scriptures. That's not what Paul tells Timothy or Titus to look for. And it's not what we should be looking for uh, as well. So he says, this is a rule that can help you get at the basics of the faith, and it can help you as you're trying to assess new doctrines. But he says in chapter 28, there are going to be some questions where you'll go back and there isn't a clear answer in the fathers. There isn't a church council. The church fathers themselves may have been divided on a question. So how do you resolve that? And here's the answer that he gives. Oh, I didn't mark it. Um, he, he uh, let's see here. Let me, let me find it because I want to get the exact wording for you. Um, he says, and therefore, as to the more ancient schisms or heresies, we ought either to confute them, if need be, by the sole authority of the scriptures, or at any rate, to shun them as having been already of old convicted and condemned by universal councils of the Catholic priesthood. In other words, what, what, what he's saying is, when you go back into those older discussions where there's not a clear unity of doctrine, um, you're not stuck then, but what you do is you go back to the scriptures and say, okay, the church hasn't worked this out, so let's go back to the Bible and let's work it out. So, I think for those of you who are familiar with some of these debates and discussions, you can definitely see areas and ways in which Vincent um, has a lot to say that will probably challenge all of us as we think about these different doctrines. Anyways, this video has gone on longer than I meant to. It's become a little bit less of a review, a little bit more of a reflection. My apologies for that. But I hope you can see I found this book to be very helpful 
very stimulating, very interesting. And so I would definitely uh, encourage you to pick up a copy of The Commonatory by Vincent of Lorenz.